more expensive uh, now. Uh, used equipment uh, is typically of a, of a decent quality. So it's like a, a, an iPhone where, you know, you desperately had to have this year's model and one year there's a new model and you have to have it. That's the same with gold equipment now. It used to be every two, three, four years back in the early 2000s or 90s, they'd come out with, you know, with really new stuff. Uh, there was a huge time with cycle, but now you can get last year's model of gold equipment really cheap used for one season and, and it's, and it's still a good product. Um, I would say it's, you don't really require a goalie helmet that they, they can be a bit more expensive. Um, but it's not required when you first want to get into position at a young age, most kids go out and get them, but, um, I don't think it's required. And, um, a lot of associations, although it may, may be limited, do have some sort of goalie program, maybe initiation, could be a monthly clinic, something of the sorts. Uh, I know it's not um, in every association, but it is becoming more common, which is a great thing. And there's often a budget on a team that's allocated uh, if, if there isn't one. So there's a little bit more resources there. So it may not be cheaper than being a player. Um, you could probably argue, but it's certainly on par. So I, I don't think that should be a, a detriment. The other one is it's more dangerous. So there's no legal contact to, to the goaltender. Chances of being hit from behind or awkwardly in the board from three feet away don't really exist. Um, the equipment is phenomenal. It is, it's not even what it was 10 years, let, let alone 15, 20, 25 years ago, it's, it's really good. And there's all different types of equipment that fit your knees and awkward little spots where you might get hit. Don't get me wrong. You're still going to get you know, a little dinger here and there and a, and a bruise here and there, but the equipment is phenomenal. And most goalie related injuries are self-inflicted at the end of the day. Um, they pull something, they overextend, um, or, or they're, they, you know, they, they reach too far, they, they move awkwardly, whatever it might be, and they, and they tweak something or they pull something. So it's not due to anybody else on the ice or contact. Uh, and again, I'm generalizing uh, to make a point. Uh, obviously, there are situations if there's a really hard puck specifically on the head or somebody crashes the net, there's always these circumstances. But for the most part, it's probably the safest position on the ice. Uh, the narrative goalies are weird. So to be frank, 50 years ago, they probably were a little bit weird um, for the reason that uh, they used to not wear masks. Like that's, that's actually a little bit insane. So uh, it makes sense that you, you were perceived to be a, a bit different if you wanted to stand in front of the, a puck being shot at 80 miles an hour uh, without any headgear, face gear, and, and really limited equipment. So uh, I do get that part of it. Um, position didn't have a lot of, a lot of resources and uh, assumption where that goalie's, you know, the, the person that can't skate becomes the goalie. And again, long time ago, that was probably true. The thing is, these things don't really exist anymore. The equipment's so good. It's like I said, the, you don't really, uh, the, the risk isn't, high to, to be injured. You, you don't have to be a daredevil to step in front of a puck anymore. So um, the mentality, the makeup of, of a goalie, I would say is pretty similar to the average person uh, on the team. Um, are there probably some kids that might be a, a little bit unique that play the position? Absolutely. But there's probably just as many forward and defense that are in the same boat. So the fact that um, there's a narrative that goalies are weird and, and I'm sure as a parent, if you've never played the sport or if you've been a, a player yourself, but never a goalie and your, your son or daughter comes to you and says, Hey, I want to be a goalie. The first thing that goes through your head is yeah, hey, goalies are a little weird, aren't they? I don't want my son or daughter to be the weird kid on the ice. So that's a real thing as much as it's, it sounds a bit, uh, out of the box, if we really think about it, it's, um, I think it plays part in the whole equation. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, what role do we as coaches play in that narrative? Um, if we're really honest with ourselves, uh, probably, 
probably more than we think and it's and it's not on purpose and it's not negative and it's not your fault it's just the way it is but hopefully moving forward it's not your fault but it is your responsibility it's your responsibility hopefully that you're you're the head coach you're the leader of of a team and you're a leader in the community and when these conversations come up hopefully you can have the knowledge now to say hey you know what yeah that's i heard that but did you know this guess what and we can start to curb that some of that so how do we do that well the three we just addressed um we kind of de debunked hopefully a little bit of that myth and the remaining portion of that list um we'll we'll cover in the next couple of slides here and this is really where it's going to relate to you as a coach um and, and how how to be become a better coach to, to help not only your goalie, but the rest of the team. So we're going to address lack of, of resources, fear of being isolated. And again, with the on ice component, uh, the fact that goalies might be a little bit weird, uh, we can address that there as well. So the best part about all this is it really requires no goalie knowledge. And I thought that was an important component to this presentation. I said right at the very beginning, the goal is not to turn you into any more of a goalie expert or specialist than you are now. Um, it's to give you information to make you a better coach to address it. So what's going to make a difference here? Okay. The lack of training and resources will address. So practicing the right way, uh, setting guidelines and expectations. So what I mean by practicing the right way, I'll, I'll give you a quick story and we'll we'll dive into this a little bit more um, with the 67s. We drafted Will Cranley three years ago and Will has a lot of potential. He's a big guy. He's pretty athletic. Uh, he was actually a little bit late uh, taking up the goaltending position, ironically, um, but had a lot of potential. And I would confidently say because of how we practice, uh, in, with the 67s and our mindset and the culture of the team, whether the 67s had a goalie coach or not, Will probably has progressed just as well, or I would say better than almost any other goalie his age in the OHL. And, and it has less to do with the goaltending coach position and more to do with the structure of our, of our team and the expectations and how we practice because you just can't replicate the experience he got, even though he wasn't playing a lot uh, in the practices that he has, I would argue on many of the teams. And that's one of the things that has made us successful uh, as a team in the last couple of years. So he's a byproduct of that. And, and I've seen firsthand um, the result of, of, of that. And I'll go into further detail here and, and explain that. So, our, our current practice standards. So you as a coach having the standards for a goaltender in practice. So I'll, re I'll just read this word for word and we'll dissect it. We have game like expectations in an environment that's not conducive to a game. So what I, what I mean by that is we have framed the expectation of what a goalie does in practice on what we expect from a game setting. We think about that for a second. However, most practices don't resemble a game setting at all. And so now we're assessing and expecting something from somebody in an environment that can't, he can't be that person within it. So how do we evaluate against a standard where the circumstances don't exist to support that standard? So what, what is kind of what I'm talking about here? Um, what is the process of a goalie that, that looks like a game that, that we can, um, I guess, think about for a practice setting and how is that impactful to the, the goaltender and the rest of your team? So I'm just going to talk about the goalie's process uh, here and what that looks like and how it relates to potentially some practice styles and the practices we want to have. So 
as a goalie, we have a process. This is widely accepted. This is not a, this is not a Charlie thing. Um, there's three stages to, to every component of goaltending. It's what they do before the shot, they making the save on the shot and what they do after the shot. So almost every component, physical component of playing, uh, skill development uh, component of goaltending can be broken up into these three categories. So we have the pre-save, the movement, positioning, tracking, posture, stance, uh, all those things, okay? We have the actual save, the reaction, the execution, uh, the moment of impact. After the save, there's the post save, that's the recovery portion. The goalie's repositioning themselves and, and continue to track the puck. And in a lot of cases, especially in practice, um, the se a second attempt, a rebound attempt, post save is your pre-save. So if there's two shots quickly back to back, there's the first shot and the movement to recover from the first shot is actually the move pre-movement of the next save. They become the same thing. So this is, this is the goalies. Uh, you guys can see my mouse. Hey, Jeff. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Perfect. This is, this is the, the, the goalies kind of path sequence of events, uh, during every sort of, uh, safe scenario. So here's the cool thing as, as a coach, you guys have control over the space in between the sequence of events that we'll call the transition. Okay, the transition is the glue that connects these three components. And when you control the situation, you control the goalie's ability to develop real game-like uh, sequences of their process, which is really, really important. This sort of stuff is the goalie's responsibility. Okay, and and. If you know a little bit about it, this is what typical most clinics are about. Pre-save, save, post-save, post okay? Really, we wanna focus on this. The transition, okay? That's where there could be a delay, where we expect urgency, and we expect compete. These are the portions of the practice that as a coach, you control. So, in the process, okay, if you have a goalie instructor or a specialist, this is their job. This is what they're working on, okay? This is your job, and this is what you can control and, and how you can impact the goalie the most. Great part is you don't need to know anything about this or anything. You don't need to have in-depth knowledge of these things to have these things work, and the next couple of slides are going to explain that. So delay, urgency, and compete. Um, when I evaluate a goalie uh, outside of just the structure and the, the, the technical aspect of it, I'm always looking at the connective tissue of the game is what I call it. So is there even a delay? Or is, or is it a smooth transition from one to the next? Does the goalie have urgency in that process? And during that process, are they competing? Are they still engaged? These are the three things as, as a goalie coach I'm looking for, uh, as well as looking for the obvious technical aspects of it. So as a, as a coach, your influence and control is going to be determined by better practice habits and practicing the right way. And I'm just going to use that term practicing the right way. It's a term we use with the 67s. It's been ingrained in my head uh, to use those, those words. And I'll explain what practicing the right way is. And to be honest, there could be uh, 10 of these sessions on practicing the right way. So I'm going to try to, to sum it up in one slide. Um, but if, if there's an opportunity for, for Mary or Norm or, or Bear to, to present again, Practicing the right way is uh, the in-depth amount of information that they could they could um, kind of fill 10 of these, uh, which is pretty cool. But practicing the right way and your timing. 
The timing of the practice, the timing of the drills are absolutely crucial and they play a huge part to the transition period of the goaltender. So you're the glue. You're, you're, you're the glue that makes it work. This is your role. When the glue works, we can execute, a goalie can execute all these things. They can go from this, you've controlled this, so the goalie can then make a save. You as the coach control this, so the goalie can then make a recovery, a post save. But when the chain's broken, okay, the next one doesn't work. And if the next one doesn't work, okay, especially when it's a, a quick second attempt, which often happens in practice, then the following one doesn't work. There's no opportunity for the next transition and the next one doesn't work. So when this, when the transitions are broken is when there's a breakdown in the goalie's process and he can no longer um, continue to, to develop. In that small five second sequence, there needs to be a complete reset and a restart. So practicing the right way, what does that, what does that mean? Um, is developing the, the team dynamic uh, and, and the overall game and game habits, um, that's, where, that's where they live. Practicing the right way lives in the transitions for the goalie, but they live in the mindset and the attitude of the players. So when player, players create game habits and practice, Goalies create game habits as well. Like I said, they create their game habits in transition because if they don't go from one step to the next with urgency and compete, those are the habits uh, for them that make them successful in a game. That's why you can have all sorts of different styles of goaltending. You know, so maybe somebody's technical foundation and structure is not that great, uh, but they still happen to be able to always make a save. It's because they have that transition period and in that, in that urgency to their game while, while trying to maintain control that allows them to go from one thing to the next. And regardless of how you make the save, this component of it remains the same. So the better the player's habits are, the better the goalie's habits are, the better your goalies are, those habits are, your, your player improves their gameplay because the habits are good, the goalie improves their gameplay because the player's habits are good. And therefore, the team improves. Okay? In my mind, every drill is a goalie drill if there's the right structure and the right timing. And that's really key. Every single time we go to the board, I just I'll look at, at our guys. They'll usually roll their eyes because they know what I'm looking for as a joke. And they'll give me one or two things. What, even if it doesn't seem like a goalie drill, if the timing's right, it's a goalie drill. And so there's always something that the goalie can focus on and pull out of every single scenario. Um, that and, and those are the sort of questions um, as a coach, I think you guys should, you should be asking goalie coaches uh, and potentially instructors and your goalies. It's, those are the, 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 questions you should be asking in the sense uh when our players break break over the blue line when our player comes out of the corner when there's this pass those are all transition periods Th those aren't um execution times those aren't technical things for a goalie though those are mindsets um th that's work ethic and and those are things you can control and those are the kind of uh questions i'd be asking so practicing the right way Practice habits become game actions. I'm just going to list a whole bunch and then I'm going to relate them to what we just talked about. So next play mentality. Next play mentality is when, uh, think of uh, pool, for, for example. You're lining up the white ball, but you know, sorry, you're lining up uh, uh, the seven ball with the white ball and you're hopefully positioning the white ball so that you have a better shot on on you know, on your next attempt. So that's having a next play mentality in hockey. It happens in a fraction of a second, but it's a hundred percent an attitude. Uh, playing fast doesn't mean you skate really quick with the puck playing fast are the decisions you make when you don't have the puck.
when you play away from the puck. That's a next play mentality. And if you can uh, have your players in a practice have a next play mentality, it's going to make a massive difference to the development of goalie because now there's an expectation for the goalie to have a next play mentality, which is a transition period, which I'll show you in a moment. Second action. Second actions, we call her just after the first shot, after the first play, then what? Do we skate to the corner? Is it done or is there a sec second action? It's, it should never really be a one and done, even in a flow drill. There's always some sort of second action to, to the execution of a shot or a play. Realistic attack routes. So if I had a dollar every time I just saw one or two guys go right down the dot lines, take a shot, that was it. I mean, in a game, it just never happens. I don't, doesn't matter if they're seven or eight or 17 or 18. To, to have somebody come over the blue line and take a different route as if they're going around uh, a defenseman, breaking wide, cutting, cutting to the middle, finding open ice. These are all game realistic things that you can apply in, in every single flow, rush, drill, zone entry drill that there is. And again, the better we make our players, the better we're going to make, make our goalies. Uh, playing one puck. Obviously, in a, in a drill, it's really common for, oh, I missed a pass. There's the closest puck. I'm going to grab it. I'm going to keep going. There's one puck in a game. And I understand sometimes it, it kills the flow uh, of a practice. But if you hold them accountable, and again, it doesn't matter what the age is. Uh, if you hold them accountable, they start understanding that if you miss the puck, you have to go and get it. And again, that's going to trickle down to the goaltenders. Being positionally responsible stopping at the net screen when it's appropriate and really screen. It doesn't mean I stand there and then I get out of the way when the shot is it's, can you stand there when the shot's coming, if it's from the defenseman or, or, or somebody else and really screen the goalie, get it, take away his eyes. And if you get hit in the shin pads or you get hit somewhere, that's, that's hockey. So it, can you, can you really do that? Because the majority of the time, most players, if they're supposed to screen in a drill, they kind of get there and then they kind of shift away. And then we, we wonder why our goalie's not that great in traffic. Well, he's never really been screened in practice. His only practice is in a game. So it's, it's being honest with ourselves when we go through uh, some of these tactics with our, with our players in our drills. Uh, having realistic pass options, having a game-like pace, finishing rebounds and recreating game scenarios. I, I could list 50 of these. These are just examples of practicing the right way. But the reason I just listed a bunch here is because I want to show you how they relate to the slides we just saw. So next play mentality is a save to post save action. This blue, okay, is this. Okay, the in-between uh, from one to the next as described in the last slide is right here, it's re represented by these actions. Second actions, recover to pre-save. Realistic attack, route, attack routes are pre-save. Save to post-save. Positional responsibility is pre-save. Stopping at the net is save and a post-save. See, if these things don't happen, how does the goalie work on transitioning from one thing to the other? Okay. Pre-save to save, pre-save to save, Game like pace, it affects all. Okay, finishing rebounds realistically, save and post save, and recreating game scenarios again affects everything. So you can see just with this example how impactful having the right habits for your players impact the goalies. And that's where I'm going to circle back to we framed an expectation for the goaltender in practice to be executing like they're in a game. But how often are, do we hold our players accountable to do game-like habits if we're really honest with ourselves? And just so you guys know, I'm not, I, don't, I don't mean to, to, to be harping on you. There's, there's a lot of really phenomenal coaches. Uh, I'm just trying to illustrate the, the connection and, and the importance of the connection. So... The other component to this is, is adjusting your timing. The timing is one of the most impactful ways uh, you can kind of form those game habits. 
you control the pace, you control the sequence. So if you need to find a way to create delays and adjust your timing, here's a couple examples. Creating tight turns in open ice. It adds three seconds to a drill. Maybe that's enough for a transition period for your goalie. Okay, transitions for player changing directions. Okay, rerouting a player. Again, it, it adds time to the sequence prior to the next person up. Okay, having an additional pass that's appropriate. Where you start your drills, just by moving the, the starting point of your drills, you can either decrease or increase the amount of time it takes to get to the net. And that's going to be impactful on, on the goalie's process. At the end of the day, the absolute most powerful tool you have is your whistle. If players don't go until you blow the whistle, you control the pace, okay? you control the timing, and you control the transition periods for your players and your goalies. The off-ice component, um, the challenge, okay, that I, I wanted to address with, with our topics at the beginning there is kind of be, being fear of being isolated and being a bit weird or different. So the easy answer to that is making them feel part of the team. And, and that seems pretty obvious, but I'll show you some examples on how we kind of set a precedent without realizing it and how maybe that doesn't happen even though we, th we think it is. So in reality, goalies are a bit unique. There's no doubt about it, okay? Their gear is different. Their responsibilities are different. That even the space they occupy on the ice is painted. It's pretty much a bullseye that says, this is your space. It's really no one else's. That's different, okay? The terminology to speak uh, about uh, the skill sets and techniques is different, okay? The pressure is different and they're not involved in conversations on the bench. And that's probably something we don't really often think about, but there's a lot of dialogue and, and camaraderie and trust uh, and team building that happens on the bench. The goalie's not a part of uh, during the game. And it, I'm not saying it has a big effect uh, uh, on the goalie specifically, but it has more of an effect on the players without the goalie being involved. So making them feel part of the team, okay? A common, a common mindset of coaches is, I was never a goalie, so I don't know how to relate, okay? I don't wanna do anything, I don't want anything to do with it because I'm not equipped with the right knowledge and I don't wanna coach you incorrectly. Another one is because of that, you know, that's why I have a goalie coach. I'm just going to let them deal with it. And there's not, no problem with that. But the problem with presenting these conversations, oh, sorry, go back there. Problem with presenting these conversations on their own is really you're distancing yourself from the situation and abstaining from the responsibility that you have to the goalie. They are part of the team. So, you've removed by, by stating any of these things, whether you realize it or not, and it's not on purpose and it's not ill-willed, but you've removed yourself from the equation in that person's hockey life with their team when it comes to developing. So it's a logical thought process and it comes with good intentions, but the message you think you're sending is, hey, don't worry, I'm not gonna mess with you. Okay, I'm not going to tell you to do something that's not reasonable or that's not right. So by making those previous statements, this is what you're trying to say. And like I said, it comes from a good place and it comes from the heart and it comes with good intentions. And, and but at the end of the day, whether you as a coach or an expert in the field or, or have vast uh, knowledge of the goaltending position, your opinion to the person playing that position holds a lot of weight. They're human at the end of the day. And you're the coach. Kids want the coach to know that they exist and that their role is important. And regardless of your level of knowledge about the position, they need to be validated 
by the person in charge of the team. And that's a really important component. So at the end of the day, what you're really saying without saying it, or what they're internalizing is, I can't relate to you and you're not a priority. I have another guy who's going to do it. And I know that sounds a little bit harsh. And that's why I, I said previously, it comes from a good place. I'm, I'm just as much uh, at, at fault with having the very similar conversations. So hopefully I haven't pissed anybody off too much and just kind of opened up, got the wheels thinking about maybe some of those conversations. So how do we make them feel a little bit more part of the team? Everything you do for the team include your goaltenders. So one big thing I see at the rink is, you know, the team does one warm up, the goalie does another. I agree the goalie may have some unique, uh, I don't know, routines that they're going to want to do. Uh, maybe they have to have a little additional time to, for their growing hip flexors, external rotation, that sort of stuff. But the goalie is going to have to find time to do that. And these are the conversations that you're going to have to have with, with the parents and with the goaltender um, is that warming up with the team is important. And it's important for the team and for the goalie to feel part of the team. If the goalie needs to do additional work before or after, no problem. But they should still warm up with the team. Okay, throwing balls during pre-ice. So what I mean by that is, is a lot of times I, I often see before a game, coach gets the whiteboard out, they're going over the game plan, goalie goes in the hall, and he gets warmed up, starts throwing balls against the wall. He has their, or she has their routine, okay? I, I believe the goalie should be part of the process in the dressing room. If it's good for the team, it's good for the goalie. And they're not really, they're never too young to start learning um, the, that part of the game, it goes back to the example I gave, uh, what's good for the players is, is good for the goalies in practice. What's good for the players is good for the goalies at game time too. I know they're going to have their own, uh, you know, their, their own, I'm just going to call it a routine, their own, own way to, to warm up their own way to get into the game. They are unique in that sense, but you guys are going to have to find uh, a solution that's uh, agreed upon with yourself, depending on the age, the parents and the goalie so that they, they get to do that, but they're also part of everything the team does. I think it's really, really, really important. Charlie, Skating. we do have a, we, we do have a question here on that. Yeah, yep. yep. Um, so uh, over the years, I've had several goalies that had very long warmups routines that effectively isolated them from the team before a game. As a coach, I felt they missed out a lot on the camaraderie um, that resulted from being around the team. How do you deal with that? So basically it's just tell, talking to them and telling them that they have to essentially do the team warm up. Is that what you're trying to get at? Yeah, it's, I mean, Hey, it's a tough, it's a touchy subject. It's, it's not an easy answer because at the end of the day, if, if that routine helps them perform, uh, we don't want to take that away from them. Uh, I guess you'd have to maybe look at how your team warms up because if, if a team is warming up properly and I don't know the age, uh, I'm going to, let's say, you know, you're at a, you're at a point where the players are taking responsibility for warming up for the, the game physically and mentally. Um, the question the is, is uh, from U20. Oh, okay. So if the team is, is doing a proper good warm up, I would say a large majority of of the goalie's physical warm-up should be covered in, in that aspect of it. And like I said, if, if there are some additional things that uh, the goalie wants to do, no, no problem. But I, I feel anyway, from my experience at the major junior level. So, so same, I'll give you the example, Mike DiPietro. Uh, well, everybody really, but I'm thinking of specifically Mike DiPietro had a very specific routine when he came to Ottawa, when we traded for him and it was about 15 minutes, but he initially, that was his comment. He said, well, I'll do, I'll do my own thing. And in our culture, that, that just wasn't really uh, accepted. And so we just kind of, we came to a conclusion that we're going to warm up with the team and you can do your own thing, no problem, but we're going to have to find a way to make that work. Um, and so he would start early, he would do it before, uh, and then he joined the team. And 
especially being in a position that he was just traded. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of legwork there to do to get that person incorporated in your team culture. And, and I thought exactly the comment, what the comment was, if he's not part of the warm up, then it's just one less opportunity to get him bonding with the rest of our team. Uh, uh, Seti Andre is, uh, he, he does absolutely does his own thing. I'm, I am somehow got sucked in to be part of that. His, his pregame routine, we just, we throw a ball around, but again, we do it before or after the rest of the team. So uh, it's, if it's a U20, it's a conversation with the kid. It's probably asking some questions. Well, what are you getting out of that, that you can't do with the rest of the team? Is there some overlap? Can we make the team warm up better if you come at it from that angle? So you're covering more of what you need, but you're doing it with your team. Um, I don't think there's a, there's not a canned simple answer to that but it's maybe find, find out what is it that they require that they're not getting in another team environment. And can you come to some middle ground that satisfies that? Is that good? Yeah, perfect, thanks. Okay, perfect. Uh, skating with the team in practice. Uh, I, I know it's, it's common that if this, the team is doing skating drills without puck specific skating drills, I know it's seen as an opportunity for, for time for the goalie to do goalie stuff. I get that completely reasonable, completely logical. If there is an opportunity for the goalie to skate with the players, I think it's a good thing. Um, I've see, actually seen uh, as much as uh, parents requesting the goalie doesn't because they're not players, that they should be doing goalie things. And if it's purely because it's the only time we have to do goalie specific stuff. Okay. I, I get it. But especially at a younger age, you're only going to become better athletes if they're skating with the team and, and goalies have to be phenomenal skaters. They don't have to be the fastest from, you know, one end of the rink to the other, but their edge work has to be impeccable and strong. Again, I'll use the example of, of Willie with the 67s and in, in that first year, we would go on 45 minutes early, three times a week, no pucks, half equipment. And Willie would just skate like a player. And, and I don't mean we skated to tire him out. I mean, he did technical skating like a player, recovering his feet underneath his body quickly because he would leave them behind when he pushed. He kind of skated like he was riding a horse. So his knees were far apart the entire year. We just worked on his stride as a player because it affected his movements as a goalie. Uh, there is a correlation there. So I'm a huge, uh, I'm a huge fan of skating and practice with the players in the full gear, learning to figure it out. It's only going to benefit them. Uh, involve them in, in as many team objectives and milestones off the ice as you can. If you have goal settings, if you have um, things you want to do, as a team, for example, if, if there are penalty killing um, kind of objectives and goals you have, include the goalie in that process. Uh, they're, they're parts, it's a, it's a six man, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a six, six man play, six man tactic with, with your team, not five. And the goalies can become a, a big asset to that. And even at a younger age, if you give them a responsibility in a, in a tactical situation, it's incredibly empowering and they feel like they're really part of it. They feel like they have a job um, that's, that's not just stop the puck. They feel like they're really part of, of the team dynamic in that sense. Uh, I just kind of covered that team tactics. And the big one of communicating with the, with the players, specifically the defense and practice, having that back and forth dialogue uh, as much as possible. Um, I, I know it's, it's preached and it's harped on, uh, all the time, I'm sure by you guys, but it is really crucial. Uh, these guys should be able to say one or two words and they know exactly what they're talking about in different scenarios. So just advocating for, for that communication and trying to implement that in practice will make a big, big deal. Again, they'll feel like they're part of the tactics of the play and they're not just isolated in their position over here. So game plan moving forward, 
your, a, a couple things to maybe consider a little bit of a self audit. So objectively evaluate your practice. What's the intent and how does it affect the goalie process? Pre-safe, safe, post-safe, post transitions in the middle. How does your practice affect those things? Okay. Try taking your five most commonly used drills and can you identify and predict the transition periods? Um, can you potentially find ways to adjust the timing to allow for that proper process? And if you're struggling to identify these, these transition points, then you probably need to make adjustments to your drills. Uh, a lot of, uh, I've done several clinics before that were uh, based on, I wanna help you uh, be a positive influence, improve your goaltending and practice, but I'm gonna do it without changing a single thing about your practice. So this is kind of the same mindset. If, if you take these things, I'm not saying, you know, come up with new drills. I'm saying add timing to the drills you have. Be aware of how it affects certain components of a goalie's process with the drills you have. And then just make tiny adjustments that's going to make everything a little bit more friendly and conducive to being able to execute that process. Um, one thing, actually, I forgot, I forgot to mention a couple of slides ago. This uh, kind of the, the mindset you guys hopefully will take with you a little bit of this information and this sort of thinking when it comes to goaltending is also going to be new for the goalie. So educating the goaltender and educating maybe the goalie's uh, um, parents on some of these processes so you can hold them to the, the, uh, that standard will be a big part of this process for you as a coach. Uh, how can you influence better practice habits, your players uh, to manage those transitions? So that was a lot of the examples of, of building a better practice, um, practicing the right way. Okay, and this is what I just mentioned, teach and define the roles um, for the goalies and yourself in the development. So, so tell the goalie on your team, this is what I'm doing. I'm doing it for you. I'm doing it so you can go from making a save to following your rebound effectively. That's why the drill is developed this way. That's why it's constructed in this manner. It's, it's so you can do the things you need to do to hopefully be better and have some urgency in your game. Okay. It, and then once you do that, you can explain the objective uh, from your end and, and from their end, okay? Clearly define what you will be processing. And, and to be honest, I just couldn't find a better word for evaluating. I didn't want to say that the word evaluating because uh, I don't want you to, you know, I don't think it's healthy to communicate to your players that you're constantly evaluating the practice. Obviously, there's, the wheels are always going in your head. Uh, and you're always assessing everybody all the time, but, but now you can say to the goalie when in this drill and in practice in general, this is what I'm looking for. You, know, you probably don't care how they make the save. You probably don't care how they recover. You probably don't care, um, about the technical aspects of it, but you can now say, I expect you after the first save to have no delay and to be engaged on that second shot. I expect you to be ready for this play because I've given you enough time, okay? Educating them on your expectations based on that process will be really powerful. And then they're gonna know what you want from them. And now you're part of the conversation and you're part of your, that development. You've removed the, I'm not a goalie. I don't wanna mess you up. I don't know what to do. You know, I hired a goalie coach. You now have inserted yourself in the process by having those conversations and it should be empowering for you and it's impactful on the goalie. So in that also, if you do have a goalie coach, uh, have a conversation with them, define their role in, in that process. And then the best part about this, you've laid the foundation, you've, you've created the pillars that you can now hold them accountable for. You, you actually have something to um, have standards. We go back to the beginning that are realistic that you can say you're happy with or you're not happy with and why. 
So you're no longer expecting uh, game-like situations or having the standard of those actions in a situation that isn't constructed for the goalie to be able to do that. You've now created a process and a structure for the goalie that they can execute those things in and you can hold them accountable for it. So off the ice, hopefully over time, you have the confidence, uh, maybe with a little bit of this information to educate some of the parents around you and say, I, I don't know about my, you know, my younger son or daughter, they're thinking about being a goalie. And you, maybe you can now say like, yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. And they say, well, you know, it's, I think it's expensive. You can say, well, you know, it's, it's not all that, it's really not any more expensive than being a player. Um, and again, that's getting into it. It's not to say that specific uh, goaltending training can't be, uh, can't have more costs. Absolutely does. The gear, a professional set of equipment is $4,000. I'm not saying that part of it's not expensive. I'm saying getting into the position uh, is very doable and the expenses aren't quite as uh, large as I think parents anticipate. Um, don't allow those stereotypes to grow. Just curb the conversation if you can and be mindful of the language you're using when you in in a joking situation and again we're all at fault myself included you know we we joke about uh some of those uh, topics and maybe if if we if we don't then we won't continue those discussions in that way and hopefully the 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 viewpoint the mindset of of goaltending in general from especially from a parent standpoint We'll, st we'll start to change. So, uh, and if you think about it this way, it's, it's not, it's not just you and in your year with that goalie and that's it. There's 10 years of minor hockey. So when those conversations are had year in and year out, and all of a sudden that goalie's 13, 14, 15, guess what, guess what his or her expectations are and the parents expectations are once they get to that point. I'm going to have to deal with this myself. Uh, I, I know, you know, we'll probably have to find maybe a goalie coach. I know I'm going to have to set aside this much budget, this much money for additional training. Um, but maybe year after year, we can stop that progression of building that mindset and we can make a difference and an impact that, yeah, of course, you're going to need some specific technical training, but hey, our practices are built for you to succeed in a game. And hopefully you see the result of that in, uh, in your games and the success of your teams. The best proofs in the pudding. So this is one of my favorite, favorite lines is, uh, yeah, he's not, you know, I'm not really a practice goalie, but he's a real gamer. You know? To me, that says, to me, that would, that would be, a reflective moment and think, well, not really a practice goalie. Maybe I got to think about my practices because pretty good in a game, something's missing there. And that's hopefully uh, a bit of a takeaway there to, to the whole presentation. So I hope I helped you in a small way uh, to be not a better goalie coach, but a better coach. Uh, even if it's just 1%, even if it's just top of mind, just one thing, I think it's a, it's a great start. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, that's my contact. Awesome. That was great. Uh, really happy with that one. Charlie, appreciate it. Um, got a couple of thank yous for this. Um, coaches that are happy that they took this because it's kind of what they needed. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a, that's always a good sign. Uh, right now, I only have one question in. Okay. Um, how do we get our goalies to compete more in practice? Well, if we, if we go back to the model, maybe I can rewind here. Hold on. I don't know a better way to do that. Sorry, one second. Oh, there we go. So if we go back to this, I guess a large, a, a huge part of the presentation is that if you can educate the goalie that you are giving them the opportunity to 
execute what would be more a more realistic game situation. It's going to take time because um, if you if you think I don't know how old uh, the age group is you're thinking about, but again there there's been uh, a standard set year in and year out, and if there's been a couple years of goalies practicing and having this sort of environment where they weren't it wasn't conducive uh, to compete for a second shot. It wasn't conducive to be set. It wasn't conducive for the goalie to act like they would in a game, to play like they would in a game. Um, maybe just because they didn't have time. Um, maybe because uh, the drills were in the past have been, have been structured that it was a one and done. So there's a good chance that they've just been in an environment where that hasn't been possible. And that's kind of what I meant by, you know, we we're framing the expectations, but they're not in a situation to be able to deliver those expectations. So we have to change the situation. Um, so how do we get them to compete is, is creating the situations and environment that allows them to compete. And I know that sounds like a bit of a, um, a flaky answer, but if, if this transition doesn't happen, there's no post save, there's no compete, right? If this transition doesn't happen, then okay, the goalie doesn't execute a save like, like they should, there's no compete. So that was really a, a large part of the presentation was that you need to put them in situations where they have to compete or else it doesn't work. They are a piece of the puzzle and, and really that starts with your players. It starts with your, with the practice habits and constructing, um, you know, a practice that's going to allow for that. Uh, and then you can hold them accountable. That's what I said. You can, you can say, Hey, we're doing this action with the second action, your job. And we're giving you the opportunity because we've timed it properly is to go from this to this. And in the middle of there's that compete factor. You need to get from A to B. You need to make this action, uh, connect with this action. And then it becomes very clear, but for a goalie just to stand there and take shots and just say, try harder. Don't get me wrong. You can just have a, a lazy kid and there's, there's no solution for that, unfortunately. Um, but if they're, if you don't think they're lazy and you think they're reachable, maybe they've just never been in a structure that really has allowed them to compete with success. It's been um, situations that weren't realistic enough. I, I hope that's not a flaky answer. I hope that helps. Well, I'll throw myself under the bus. That was for me. So, oh, okay, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> um, we have one, and I'm going to throw the other coach under the bus here from Dave sure. Stathos. Uh, what are you going to tell your kid hey, when Dave. he or she tells you they want to be a goalie? <laughs> <laughs> well, I am expecting. Uh, so that's a that's a great question. Um, I already have the pads ordered. They're uh, three inch <laughs> plus plus a half. Um, you, I'll, I'll, I'll give them the, uh, I know the standard answer is, is, are you sure you're not going to miss scoring goals? Are you sure you're not going to miss, you know, doing this with, with your buddies? Um, uh, Hey, whatever they, what they want to do, you have a son. That's a, that's a, that's a goalie. Actually, I should ask you how that conversation go. Did you try to talk them into it or out of it or were you neutral? <laughs> Awesome. Uh, we do have a couple more questions coming in now. Um, so any favorite drills that are, are your go-to drills for your goalies? Um, yeah. Uh, yes. Yes and no. I would say the, the situation would define the drills I'm going to do on a daily basis. Um, but I, I do think, and, and this is something that as a coach you have control of, I do think having a good uh, warm up style drill is important at the beginning of practice for your goalie. And that doesn't mean uh, the players are, are, are taking a holiday. That, that just means the shots are at a distance that they're easily tracked and there's enough time to go from one to the next. Um, so the example I would say with like with the 67s, we just do this, it's called three lines. The three line drill, they line up on the red line. First guy goes, takes a shot. And then for the player's standpoint, it has to be before the ring out line. They simulate a rush. They take two steps and attack at a different angle. They get over the line. They take their shot. 
they stop hard and then they sprint back to the red line. If they don't touch the red line, everybody's skating. So they're responsible for themselves. So now it's become not just a goalie warm up drill. It's good for the goalie, the shots from a distance, right? It allows them to follow it, but they have to have urgency to get to the next one. And the next player doesn't go until um, that player gets over the, over the blue line, which coincidentally gives them enough time. I would say in our entire practice, I said the whistle is the most powerful tool you have. It's the only drill ever that the head coach doesn't use his whistle on every single rep. That one's on the players. And I don't think we have another one that isn't on, uh, isn't controlled by the coach. So do, do I have a couple of favorites? Yeah. Really, really hard to kind of have that conversation in this meeting, but I'm be happy to send an email with a couple ideas that are a little bit more uh, specific for sure. Perfect. Um, when you see something in practice that does not allow the goalies to follow their process, do you immediately bring it up with the head coach to make sure it does not happen again? And you, when you're bringing what, and if, or when you bring it up, do you make recommendations on how to improve the drill? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And great. Phenomenal question. Uh, if you are in a position where you're, you're the goalie coach, guy, instructor, uh, I, I would say one of two scenarios. If you're a, an instructor that is coming on a biweekly basis and you're not part of the staff, I think how you communicate to the coach and the staff is different than if you, if you are a parent or, or play a regular role in that staff. Um, if you're, somebody who's coming in to help out every once in a while. Um, I think the conversation uh, could be had, but you would want to be really careful how you broach that subject. I think it's important that you do. Uh, so the short answer would be yes, but very delicately. And I wouldn't say, hey, uh, this is wrong. I would maybe try to educate a little bit on the process and just say it'd be super beneficial if um, I've done this before and make it more of an open-ended conversation as opposed to why don't you try this in your drill? Uh, if you're part of a staff, I think it's a little bit easier. Hopefully um, the relationships are good and, and it's an open dialogue. And I would absolutely, if you have a good relationship, have no problem um, kind of broaching that subject, especially if it's just in a manner that kind of the same way I presented to you, I'm not I'm not saying you have to do X, Y, and Z, and these are goalie uh, specific skill sets. You're helping that coach the same way in a sense that hopefully I'm, I'm helping uh, you is just to see the position differently. If, if you look at a goaltender differently from today on out, because you see what's on the screen right now, you see a movement, Okay. And then some sort of transition from one thing to another, you see a save and then another transition as a coach, that would be phenomenal. Um, you're miles ahead of the game of most coaches. So I'd say depend on your relationship. Um, but absolutely. Perfect. Um, next one. How do, would you deal with a goalie coach that tells you that he knows more than you because he's been a goalie all his life, but clearly doing his job wrong and <laughs> you off all the time. <laughs> fire him <laughs> <laughs> oh that's a good one um well maybe give me an example just so i have a little bit of context to that if, if that's possible um so the person who sent that in if you want to send me a follow-up we'll move on to the next one and we'll come back um next one uh, what feedback do you give goalies between periods in a game when you, uh, when they are underperforming? Um, I'm going to, oh, good question. And, and I hate saying it depends. Uh, it's, it sounds like a cop-out answer, but uh, there's something that we do that's really changed how I look at uh, communication with our goaltenders. And, and it's uh, every every goal or every person that comes through the 67s organization does a disc assessment and that disc assessment identifies a personality type and a communication style. And I can tell you it's changed me as a coach in terms of how I communicate. Um, and there's four different categories. And I know it's a common business uh, practice as well. So some of you might be familiar with that, but I, I'll give you an example. 
uh, in preseason last season. Uh, I think it was Will Cranley's very first game in preseason. Uh, he had four goals in the first period. Uh, he looked nervous. He looked sh pretty shaky. Um, there were some good goals, uh, but it was obvious that he was struggling. And when he came into the uh, off afterwards, he was almost uh, shaking. He was, you know, he was nervous. I gave him a second. And I know that he is a, uh, an I style and a C style. So for Willie, that means he needs to know that people trust him. Uh, and he, and he needs to know that he has the confidence of his team. That's the I, um, and the C style or sorry, S for S is for support, not I. And the C style is, uh, very structured. Uh, he, he needs to know the step-by-step -step process before he begins. So if I went in there and I communicated to him, uh, in a way that wasn't in that style, it would have had zero effect. In fact, it probably would have had a negative effect. So all I said to him is, Hey, don't worry. Your team still believes in you. Okay. We all trust you're going to get the job done. You know, shit happens. Um, the goals specifically, if you took them, if you took one of those goals and you put them in a three, one win, you wouldn't think anything of it. Uh, it's just because you had four in a period, uh, you feel a bit flustered, but everybody loves you and trusts you. And we know you're going to be able to compete for the rest of the game. And here's what we're going to do. Do A, B, and C when you get out there. And those weren't like tech, uh, technical instructions. Those were mental cues just to get him refocused. So I used both of his communication styles to help that communication or to help that scenario. So usually what I say, to be honest, has, has little to do with hockey and more to do with um, uh, touching on, on an emotional a component that I know is going to help them reset. Uh, I also do a lot of box breathing uh, in between periods, which is just a real simple um, exhale, four seconds, hold, inhale, uh, four seconds, hold. Um, and that just uh, gives a little bit of calm and clarity uh, and helps, again, helps the goalie reset. So to be honest, it really doesn't usually have much to do with the game. It has everything to do with their, their, uh, mental state and how to get it reset and how to get their confidence back in five minutes. Awesome. So coming back to the uh, fire your goalie coach question uh, <laughs> during the goalie process. So for an example, during the goalie process, following a shot altogether, or even when it comes to positioning in the net, even better yet to the necessary equipment example, not wearing a neck guard at minor level U nine. So this is the goalie coach saying could you reframe the first one just uh, sorry um so during the goalie process following yep. a shot yeah um, or even when it comes to positioning in the net so sorry though jeff is it is it the coach that has a problem with the goalie coach yes he's just simply just not on, on point I, yeah, I, sounds like uh, he knows more than the head coach ah okay um Geez, that's a tough one. <laughs> that's that that sounds like it has absolutely nothing to do with goaltending and everything to do with relationships. Um, and and that might just be a conflict of 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 interest for the team and and how you want to operate your staff. I don't know if you have a choice to have that person there. Um, I'm it's not to say they're bad and and or good or or whatever, good person or or not a good person, but uh, obviously your philosophies are not aligning and it probably sounds like a bit of a toxic environment. And to be honest, it sounds like it has nothing to do with goaltending and everything to do with the relationship. So personalities. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Personalities and, and how you see things T tough situation. I hate to be in that situation, but if you're the head coach, chances are you're not going anywhere. So maybe it's best if there's another, somebody else does in the nicest possible way. Gotcha. Yeah, that, I, I don't see it coming, coming back from that is what I'm saying. Unless there's a real, what I would call coming to Jesus meeting um, where, you know, Hey, let's go for a beer and have a conversation. But outside that. Perfect. 
Um, so next question, a little bit easier. Um, Marty, <laughs> Berder, Marty Berder started in goal uh, at a peewee level. What age would you recommend kids specialize? Uh, I do believe that it, it's really important for kids to get to a really strong foundation. You do see kids literally learning how to skate with goal equipment on. And I think that's a, a detriment to the development. Um, so I, I, I know that they start younger specializing, um, but I, I'm okay with a, I'm okay with the peewee, maybe second year, year Adam, or even in a, in a half role in, in Adam and then a full role in peewee. I, you know what? I'm, I'm okay with that. I, I'm a huge, um, believer in playing multiple sports up until a certain age and learning to play hockey as a player as well as a goalie to, to start out with for the first couple of years, it's only going to make you a better goalie. Um, that I know for sure. Perfect. Great answer. Um, got a couple more here. I'll get you out. And four or okay. five. I think. Um, what age group of goalies do you work with in your clinics? Uh, all ages, right from, uh, and I'm contradicting myself, right from six. <laughs> But yeah, all, all ages, uh, right, beginner, beginner to pro. Yep. Perfect. Um, goalie process is great and will def definitely use, but do you feel it is also important to put them in smaller games where they have to react with athleticism and do not have as much transition time? Yeah, hundred percent. And I, and I should have, I should have said that at some point throughout the presentation. So I'm glad that question came up. There are going to be situations and times in practice where you're going to want to accomplish something and it's just not realistic for the goalie. Um, and you know what? That's okay. That's okay. Once in a while, that's okay in certain situations. I think the important thing to that is just you communicate with them. You know, even if you say, you know, the, the first part of this, uh, it's not really conducive to what you need to do, but you know, this second part for, for sure, you can be act, play an active role, uh, something like that. I think as long as you um, communicate that, then you're gonna you're gonna avoid any any issues because they know what to expect at the end of the day. And even if they can't physically um, go through the proper process, mentally they can still remain engaged to a certain point. So if you have a situation where there's there's let's just say there's two shots, you know, pretty quickly uh, one after the other, you might say, hey for this first shot, you're not going to have time to follow that rebound. That's okay. At least you can track it out, even if your body doesn't go in that direction. So see where it goes, and then you're going to have to get over. Is that cool? You're setting that expectation, um, and you're letting them know that you know, and that's really important uh, that, that you just, you get it. Um, and so, yeah, small area games are phenomenal. Putting, I, I say this all the time as a goalie coach, Obviously, it depends on the situation a little bit, but often my goal is to get you to fail because if you don't fail at any point, how do we know where the line is to, to, to have you improve? How do you know what you're capable of if you, if you never fail at, at anything? So, you know, if we're doing a goalie-specific session, there are a lot of times I'm creating some pretty tough scenarios to push that line so they, so they do fail or I'm asking them to do something that's a bit unrealistic, like a, uh, stay on your feet, even though it's not realistic, or get to your feet, even though it's not realistic. Uh, I, I kind of equate that example I give is playing a whole round of golf with the same club. If you play the whole round of golf with a six iron, would your score be all that great? No. So, you know, with the results, are you going to make every save? No. But are you going to know what you can do with your six iron after 18 holes? You sure will. So, that's um, that's a, a mind, mindset is pushing the failure in a healthy way. Small area game is fantastic. Some drills aren't going to be realistic. That's fine. Just communicate it. That's all. Awesome. And, and there's a level of compete there too. Just sorry, Jeff, just to take yep. those specific words out of the transition, right? Like, uh, so zero delay means that there's a there the transition as fast as possible there's no pause after an action um and that's conducive to having urgency okay not only physically but mentally and while they're doing that they're competing 
So that to me sounds like a small area game. Perfect. Perfect. Um, how do you recommend a goalie parent encourage the coach to provide the practice environment you have described? Uh, so if you are a goalie parent to encourage the coach. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it might be helpful. I could, I could maybe make, are these slides available? Um, well, I'm going to uh, put this uh, webinar right onto YouTube. So it'll be up oh, okay. there for everyone to access. I, again, I think that the easiest, fastest answer is through some, just a little bit of healthy education. And it's not that you're going to come in there uh, saying like, Hey, I'm an expert. I know what to do here. You're not doing your job. No, it's like, Hey, have you ever, you ever thought of it this way? Look, this is kind of a different way to think about it. This is kind of neat. If you, if you kind of approach it that way, there's an analogy. I forget the, um, I forget the name of the analogy. I think it's, I think it's called, it's not called curbing. It's called, uh, it's kind of merging. So if, if you're going in this direction and you want to make a change and you attack it like this, there's usually a, uh, in, in traffic, there's a fatal collision. If you can picture merging onto a highway, we're going in this direction and you just slowly do this, your results are going to be a lot, a lot more impactful without creating the, the uh, negative collateral um, of, of a bad impact. So I would say try to reduce the impact in conversation uh, and educate's usually a good word, but sometimes people take it negatively and it really depends on how you bring it up. If you said, hey, hey, I'd like to educate you. That's not going to go so well. Um, <laughs> but if you if you broach the subject like, uh, hey, this is kind of neat. Uh, I've seen that, you know, I've heard this has kind of worked before. What do you think of this? And, and, and broach it that way. You could probably get some traction for sure. And if, and uh, if this is on YouTube, maybe just pause it, copy and paste, even throw it on your phone. Easy to kind of show uh, the coach in a conversation. I think you'll, you'll find that's probably a little more successful. Perfect. Um, okay, next one, uh, Ala Patrick Wall here. Um, not sure how to ask this. Are superstitions and rituals taught? So for example, would, uh, would an example would be Devin Levy uh, in this past World Juniors stick in the pads and drink water every whistle, no matter what the play was before. It's absolutely not talk taught. And you know what, that's something that was, wasn't in my presentation on goalies are a bit weird. Um, that could, that could probably be another contributing factor is that, you know, they often have these quirky little, uh, little, little uh, traditions like that. So they're certainly not taught. Um, but I would say this, if, if it is, um, detriment, if it gets to the point where not doing something is negatively impacting their performance because they didn't do it, then it's a problem. Um, it's, it's, uh, there's something that's a little bit different between a ritual and a routine. Um, and if the ritual, uh, which really has no bearing on their play, it's just, a, it's a mental, uh, it's a mental thing. But if that ritual becomes uh, negative, uh, let's say the bus is late. Let's say there's not the required space that they would normally do it. Let's say uh, the posts don't have pegs, so they can't do whatever. The glass isn't the same, so they can't do their twirl and look at them, like whatever. There could be a bazillion reasons why they can't do something, a little part of their ritual. Um, and all of a sudden that actually affects their their gameplay. That's not healthy. Um, but if it's if it's kept to a degree that's just, hey, it kind of helps me uh, get my mind into it. Da, 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 da. And, and hey, if, if it doesn't happen because of whatever, something that's completely out of their control or your control, and it's not impacting them and it's not a big deal, then I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Perfect. So no superstitions, more routines. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, superstitions, I don't, well, I don't really believe in them and they're not, I don't think usually they create a healthy mindset uh, because they can be altered because you are relying on an external factor most of the time to determine your mindset or performance. Awesome. I wouldn't want to hang my hat on that. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. Um, okay. Two more and we'll get you out of here. All good. Uh, how, much, how much pre-scouting and video uh, do you do with the goalies to prepare for a game or is it more for the playoffs? 
and how much practice video do you use with your tenders? Uh, I, I use more of the practice video uh, if I have to make a point and from a technical aspect. Um, so I've used, I secretly videoed from the bench once, once during practice um, just because I had a conversation. The goalie thought he was doing something, but he wasn't. It wasn't technical. It was actually part of a transition process. There was urgency. He said, oh, I'm, I'm always on it. And I said, okay. And I went to the bench and I filmed him from, from 60 feet away. And he saw he was not on it. Um, so I just used that for, for a little bit of collateral. Um, but practice, I use it for immediate feedback. If we're working on, on a skill set uh, in a game, we would typically review every game um, right after, to be honest. Um, we try to do it the same night uh, or, or the next, early the next day so it's fresh. If it was a, a really bad game, then maybe we just mutually decide for whatever reason, uh, no. Um, but often we'll do it, we'll do it right after, or, or we'll do it the next day. Um, or if, if they're on a road trip, I don't go on road trips, uh, or I, it's my, it's my choice. So I don't, I don't get on all the road trips, but you know, we'll come back, we'll review all three games at the very next practice. So it's as close to game time as possible. So the, 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 uh, the thoughts fresh. Um, so every single game we, we review and we're not really picking apart every play, um, Honestly, I, for the most part, I let it roll and I'm picking up tendencies. I'm, I'm looking for things that happen more than once. Um, I would say for a, a rookie goalie, for Willie, the last couple of years, it's been more of an education process on, um, on hockey and not goaltending, on, on the other team's tactical components, on looking off the puck, off um, managing decisions, off reading the play. It had actually nothing to do with him. It had everything to do with with reading the play uh, with somebody like SETI, he's mature enough. Uh, he's been, he, he's been around long enough that, and the biggest aspect, the hugest, hugest uh, uh, part of his game that gives him a ton of success is his ability to read the play. So that's not something that we discuss too, too often. It's, it, it's actually a little bit more technical with him. Um, and it's more him asking me questions. I, I typically just ask questions well, what did you think of that? Well, what was your mindset when this happened? Um, did you <laughs> some, did you mean to do that? Or, or did you see that shot? Did you track that? Well, like I just engage with a question and I get them to explain it to me instead of me explaining it to them. Um, and I feel like they come to their own conclusions. It's a much healthier discussion. Um, so it's not coach doing this. Uh, I'm just inviting a conversation. Awesome. Uh, last one. Let me get you out of here. That's right. Actually, on, on that, it's a funny story. So this is SETI in a nutshell. There was a two-on-one situation. SETI was probably 15 feet outside his crease. And the guy shot and he made a save. And I, I just kind of went, yeah, I know, you know, you're good at playing aggressive, but eh, that was, a, that was a, maybe a little high on that play. He said, no, I knew he was shooting. I said, oh, you, you knew 100% he was shooting. He said, yep. I said, it was a two and one. If the other guy got the puck, it was an open net by 30 feet. He said, no, I knew he was shooting. I said, well, how do you know? He said, well, in the first, so that was the third period. He said, well, in the first period, the same two guys came down on a two and one, but the other guy had the puck and the other guy was really open. He called for it and he didn't pass it. So I knew that this time when the other guy had the puck, he wasn't passing. <laughs> and so said he literally was able to like, in in the game to notice the guy who didn't receive the puck on the first play, hit a stick, go to the bench and be pissed. And then he noticed him have a conversation with the other guy. So he literally knew the emotional status of those two players. Two periods later, he made a decision based on that observation. That's his ability to read the game. Yeah, that's uh, that's a little advanced. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. Uh, last one. Um, do you recommend that parents of the goalie help or stay away from helping the goalie during a practice if they are one, uh, one of the coaches? Great question. Uh, so I would guess that this is a little bit more in like a technical structured way. Like, Hey, I got 10 minutes. Let's, let's do some goalie specific stuff. That sort of thing. Uh, Mike, um, if you want to unmute your mic. 
Mike, if you're still here. Yeah, uh, more just if uh, you have a parent that's, you know, if you do have a little bit of time to work um, with your goalies, it's just to try and see um, should they be working with them or would you rather have somebody else that could do some of that stuff as well? I, I would say if, if they don't have, if you have a, a parent who has the same uh, level of expertise and knowledge as a non-parent, I would say the non-parent of the goalie would probably be a little bit more impactful. If you have a parent, um, like I think I saw Mark Cavillan on the call, who was a pro goal defender, was a goalie coach, played the position at a high level, I think that it's probably appropriate that that person can can handle it. They're going to know how to communicate, even though they're probably going to be able to, to switch on, um, you know, parent mode to coach mode. Um, but I would say if all things are equal and the, the ability to coach or instruct is equal, I'd go with the non-parent. It's probably going to save the parent some relationship headaches at some point. Uh, perfect. And we'll give it, a, I'll give a little example of that. Uh, Patrick Wall, when he was coacher, he still is, but before coaching the Quebec Ramparts, uh, when asked um, if you talk to the goalies during uh, practice and he said, nope, we have a goalie coach for that. Yeah. So, um, that's not my job. Um, awesome. Thanks a lot, Charlie. I really, really appreciate that. It was uh, some really good discussion tonight for, for our coaches. Thank you. That, no problem. And, and like I said, I, I hope it didn't come across um, like uh, coaches aren't mindful and, and not doing a good, good job, especially when it comes to the emotional kind of conversational side of things. Uh, uh, it was more just to shed a light on these things are probably a little bit more impactful long-term than, than we realize. Um, so uh, it certainly wasn't to point any finger. So I hope it didn't come across that way. No, it was a really good presentation. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks a lot. And like I said, this will be up on our, our YouTube page in the next couple of days. Um, thanks a lot, guys. Have a good night. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Charlie.